Okay, we were good. All right. I'll call to order the Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021 meeting of the Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, Joe's not here, so I'll take attendance. I'm here, uh, Vice Chairman Allard. Here. Uh, Joe Hammer's not here. Jim Hughes. He's here. George Oichel. He's here and muted. Tom Dean. Here. Okay. Tony Hamicki. Here. Uh, Dave Edwards. Not here. Mike Vieira. Not here. Dave Drake. He's here and muted. Yolanda. Yes. Here. Hazim. Here. Here. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> We'll seat the three alternates, and then we'll have a full complement of nine. Um, first item of business is an 824 review disposition of town property, parcel ID 272-007, Middletown Avenue. Somebody going to present that, or? I guess I'll um I'll take that one. Um, I don't think uh, town manager is going to going to join us tonight. Let me just let the one or two stragglers here. Let me let them into the meeting before I get going. Okay. Okay. Um, you should have received in your packet a uh, referral letter dated February 18th uh, of this year from uh, town manager Gary Evans referring uh, this potential uh, property disposition to the commission for a report under uh, CGS 8-24. Your packet should have also included correspondence from uh, the Great Meadows Conservation Trust, as well as from Paul O'Keefe in his capacity uh, at, with the Weathersfield Game Club. Uh, in essence, uh, the town has put this property, which is located um, almost in Rocky Hill in the Great Meadows, uh, up for uh, disposition. Uh, the property was acquired by the town back in 1973 from the Connecticut DOT. I think it was surplus land from the um, I-91 um, construction. Um, I think Jim Hughes is joining us now um, and was uh, deeded to the town with a specific stipulation that the property would uh, remain as open space or it would revert back to the Connecticut DOT if that were um, ever to uh, unfold that it was not going to be used for uh, open space purposes. So the town uh, put this out uh, for a bid, received two bids uh, from the two parties that I mentioned, the um, Great Meadows Conservation Trust who, who bid $100 and the Weathersfield Game Club uh, who bid $30,000. Both of their proposals kind of lay out um, you know, their mission how they would um, foster and maintain the property uh, related to their specific organizations. Um, the, there was a map which shows you the location uh, of the property uh, in town. Just to um, orient you, as I said earlier, uh, the property is uh, located uh, just off of Middletown Avenue, south of the interstate, almost in um, Rocky Hill. It's just north of the uh, sewer treatment plant uh, off of Middletown Avenue. It is um, uh, presently um, vacant. It's primarily um, in the flood zone. Um, it's also got a significant amount of wetlands. It's located in the AG zone. It also has a little bit of A residential and um, is also partially located in the historic district. So it's got a lot of uh, unusual uh, aspects uh, to it that you don't uh, typically see. As I mentioned uh, earlier, the town has owned the property uh, since 1973. It is in essence landlocked. It does not have frontage on a, uh, an accessible uh, street. It's surrounded by uh, property own, owned by the game club uh, on the north. Uh, on the by the game club also on the east um, and then uh, by the game club and the Great Meadows Concert Conser uh, Great Meadows Conservation Trust on the south. Um, 
It does have um, a pond and, and a small brook that runs through it. Um, it's 15.9 acres in size. I think those are the uh, those are the highlights of the specifics of the property. Um, I think many people were uh, surprisingly unaware that the town even owned this property uh, because it's out of sight, uh, out of mind. You did also receive a copy of the deed from the uh, Connecticut uh, DOT back to the town in 1973, a copy of the town's tax card, just to give you some other uh, details about the property. And that should have all been included uh, in, your, in your packet. So this is um, before you for a report under uh, the 824 statutes before the town disposes of property. It has to be provided uh, to the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission uh, for a report and you have 35 days to provide that report back to the town council. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Um, yeah, P Peter, this is David Drake. I, I, read, I read the documents. I'm just trying to struggle, struggle what the P and Z would have, what input we would have. I mean, isn't just, just, a, just a business decision by the town? I mean, nobody can use it. Is, so what do we, what input do we have? I what should we have? Yeah, I don't know. I think the only input you might have is any commentary you had on either one of the proposals, whether you feel strongly uh, either way. Uh, about the specifics of the proposal. Obviously, there's a, a bit of a, a price difference between the proposals. One was $100 and the other was uh, 30,000 and it would remain uh, taxable. Um, I think that's what it said in the report. Um, both parties have um, kind of variations on the same theme as to how they would you know, continue to own and maintain the properties. Um, I think that's really the extent it can't be used for anything other than sitting in an open space condition. So I think, you know, those are the distinctions that the council uh, wants to report. They did also refer, they also referred it to the Conservation Commission, the Wetlands Commission, uh, which is gonna happen uh, later, later this month as well. The only thing I didn't see on this thing, but from the game club is, well, well if they get it, will people be able to walk on it or is it now a private thing and they, you know, there's nothing in any of these reports that says who gets to walk on it as an open space. Do you have any input on that? Certainly the game club members, I would assume under the game club's ownership would be able to uh, walk. The uh, Great Meadows Conservation Trust, as you saw in their letter, uh, hosts a series of educational uh, walks uh, in the winter and at other times of the year. So I would imagine uh, they may try and incorporate this property into those um, winter walks. Uh, however, this property has some um, environmental uh, limitations for walking. It's got a, a surface water. It's got some brooks. And so it might be a little, little challenging to get the public uh, to walk out there. But I would imagine uh, the Great Meadow Trust uh, would certainly um, try and incorporate it into their mission statement whereas the game club, it may be limited uh, to their members, although I can't say, say that with 100% certainty. But, that, but that's something, that's input we could provide though, right? I mean, I'm just trying to think aloud. That's, yes, that's I, think, some, yeah. I think there, there are suggested um, you know, conditions on the sale or other aspects of the proposal that you would want to pass on in your report. I think those are all worthwhile considerations for the council to think about. Dave, I think, this is George, I think that would be a condition we'd want to put in, I think. I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. So, uh, and, and, and Peter, the Conservation Commission hasn't taken a position because they haven't gotten this one yet, no? It has not been in, in front of them yet. I think they have a meeting in two weeks. Of course, I, yeah. I think this makes sense to go ahead with this because uh, they're willing to Give the town thirty thousand dollars, aren't they? And uh, and then the taxes on it too, whatever that is. And I don't know if the land trust would. And the land trust doesn't really comment on the game club uh, ownership on this, do they? Really, I don't think they do. They, I think they don't care. They, they, they have common interests and. Uh, the only issue is with what other conditions would we put on it? Uh, you know, we don't want to open it up 
uh, to uh, whoever wants to go on it. And if the game club refuses that, I'm not sure I would go along with it here. But that's my feeling. George, I'm with you exact same thing. Someone wanted to go down and walk the dog on the corner. And I hate to see him get arrested. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, Peter, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, Jim. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was having an audio difficulty previously. Yeah. Yeah, I think, George, you're, you hit the nail on the head. I believe uh, all the years in town, the two organizations have very, they have parallel interests of preserving the, uh, the environment there. I know the game club always has big cleanups and really maintains things and their members really take a lot of personal pride in that property, in their property. And I, I would think, I, I'm just taking a guess here that they, if it's in the preservation trust, they probably can't hunt on it. And since it does have water on it, it makes sense to, to buffer their other areas that they own and that they've taken care of over the years. So I, I would think with the appropriate, we, there may already be an agreement in place where the, uh, the trust and the game club, you know, they can walk and do certain things on the properties. But I'm all in favor of the uh, 30,000 does mean something. I mean, to me, it does impact the town. If we every time a 30,000 comes along, we just throw it away. It does matter. It all adds up. I agree. But uh, is there ever an, an agreement that uh, between no. both? Right? I don't know. I do know where the property is. I was familiar with it. It's I mean, it abuts 91. So it's, you know, but uh, and I do know. Yeah, I, we I, all are. We all generally know where that is. But the point is. You, do we want to put a condition in there? That's all we were, I was talking about before. Right, I got you. I got you. Okay. I got you. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I, I'll just throw in a couple things to, to go back to Dave's original question about what our role is under 824. Frankly, I think the, the biggest and clearest part of our role is, you know, is this property that the town should sell or is it property that the town should keep? And um, given that I don't think more than two people in town knew that we owned it in the first place, um, I don't see a compelling reason to keep it and you know, would support the council's decision to um, put it out to bid to, you know, to potentially find somebody else to own it and take care of it and worry about it and insure it and manage it. Um, you know, I, I think following up on, on Jim's point, you know, $30,000 and putting it on the tax rolls where it hasn't been for the last 50 years, you know, strikes me as a positive thing. Um, you know, particularly since the, the deed restrictions prevent any kind of meaningful or even you know, unmeaningful development of the property. Uh, I'm not I'm not too worried about, you know, whether the game club is going to put up a pavilion or something there and, you know, undermine the, you know, kind of passive recreation purposes. I agree yeah, with you, Bob. Really, Rich. And uh, I want I want to say one more thing. You know, Paul O'Keefe is is a native of. Weathersfield. He may live in Glastonbury, but uh, and other than worrying about, you know, all of the area that the game club is responsible for, I think he's trying to help Weathersfield out here with the taxes and uh, the ownership and the taking care of it. I'm not worried about any of it. I just, we just have to deal with anything we have to say to the council uh, or condition or two. But, uh, I, I'm very happy, Paul, you know, grew up with my kids. And uh, so I have known him so well that uh, I've lost track of him over there at Glastonbury. But uh, I know he's doing, trying to do everything he can for the town of Wethersfield. And this is just one more effort. Okay, thanks. Um, anyone else have any thoughts or comments on this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, before I make up you know, any mind of any position that I would take on the issues, I do have a couple of questions for Peter, if I may. Sure. Um, Peter, um, 
it seems to me the the most important consideration here is uh, how best uh, this parcel can or who is best to be able to take this parcel and and comply with the uh, the deed restrictions and I think the uh, the, the, the dominant uh, environmental concerns that uh, town residents may have with regards, with regards to the future of this parcel. Um, is, have there been any uh, comments from any other organizations, any the townspeople, any, anyone other than the, the two organizations that have put forth bids relative to uh, the proposition for selling this parcel and any commentary with regards to the the two uh, prospective bidders for this parcel. Uh, Tom, I'm not aware of, of it having um, gotten to that public dialogue point yet. I think when it comes back to the council with uh, our report and the Wetlands Commission's report, there may be additional uh, public commentary at that time. I was not part of the initial council meeting where it was referred to you. So I can't speak to the specifics of that, but there will be uh, opportunity for that when it goes back to the council before the council decides how to dispose of the property. Uh, do you have any information or any, any uh, history uh, with respect to uh, the two organizations that have bid for this property and their, their, you know, their compliance or their, their devotion to uh, you know, uh, the preservation of, of Mother Nature as it, re as it would re impact upon this property. So both organizations, the Great Meadows Conservation Trust and the Weathersfield Game Club, have proven themselves over the years to be uh, fantastic stewards of the properties that they've acquired over the years. And both of them uh, have significant holdings um, uh, particularly the Great Meadows Conservation Trust in not only Weathersfield, but um, the other Great Meadows communities, Glastonbury. Uh, I think they may have some on the other side of the river uh, in, um, in our triangle and also um, to a certain extent in, in Rocky Hill. So both organizations um, should be commended for the work that they've done uh, over the many years. I think both organizations um, are, are well over 50 years in existence and, and have a phenomenal uh, track record and, and great community relations and provide valuable um, uh, commitment to the land uh, in, in those communities. Just uh, as a, and as add on to that, um, I did take a look at the plan of conservation and development. And one of the, um, one of the recommendations is that the town should support um, uh, the organizations uh, that are dedicated uh, to preserving open space as a way to help protect natural resources. So clearly um, uh, giving the ownership of this property to either one of the organizations as stewards of the land uh, further helps to promote some of the objectives of the town's plan of conservation and development. Because as you know, the town is not necessarily uh, the best maintainer of the properties that we do have. Um, and uh, both of, however, both of these organizations with their mission statements and the, uh, the activities that they support uh, have a proven track record in that area. Uh, thank you. There's one other question or concern that I've got, and that is from the, the documentation that we were provided, uh, it seems as though the assessed value of the parcel uh, was set at, at uh, over $100,000, and the, the high bid on this is 30000 Do you have any uh, comment or reference point uh, that you could guide us with respect to that issue? Sure, I think if you look at the, uh, the Game Club letter, they made reference, uh, I think it was the Game Club letter, to the um, acquisition of some of the uh, Keisha property in the last few years. I mean, these properties don't come along all that often, so it, they're hard to hard to compare. But I think they uh, made reference to a recent acquisition and that the uh, price tag by comparison uh, was certainly um, in, in the ballpark. So, and um, I mean, this is kind of a bid process. So you, you get what you, you know, 
you get what you receive going through that particular process rather than negotiating with an individual, um, you know, interested party. So. It also strikes me that the, you know, the, the, you know, assessment or the, the town appraisal at $145,000 is basically meaningless because it's not on the tax rolls because the town owns it and, you know, it's landlocked and undevelopable. And I guess, you know, the town just hasn't bothered to appeal the assessment on the <laughs> taxes that it's not paying. So it, it's just picking the same, you know, uh, commercial excess vacant land value of $10,000 an acre that um, they've used elsewhere in town. But know. it's probably, it's yeah, probably worth more when it's, but doesn't that piece flood? Anyway, I was going to say uh, some of the other properties down there are tillable and can be used for farming purposes. Whereas if you look at the, uh, the aerial uh, maps of the property, there's standing water, there's streams. Um, it's great. Uh, it's probably great duck habitat, but um, not necessarily usable for any other uh, purposes that would, uh, you know, increase the valuation of the property. It's, it's certainly a unique property, I guess, is what I'm saying. I'm much obliged for the, the answers and the, other, the commentary by the other commissioners on this. I think there were questions that needed to be asked before we uh, generate a report back to the town council. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Tony, did you um, want to say George, George here, I have another question. Okay. Peter, you don't think that they intend to use this for duck blinds and shooting down in there, do you? I, I, I don't, I can't speak to that. I know they, they will um, enhance um, the habitat down there uh, to encourage, um, you know, the uh, property for, um, for wildlife, you know, restoration, uh, whether it's ducks or other uh, birds, that kind of thing. So um, I don't know that they were planning on uh, using it for um, active hunting purposes. They do uh, own, as I said earlier, adjoining properties. So their holdings would be um, expanded um, in proximity to this property by acquiring it. Uh, but I can't speak to whether they intend, um, I, I don't know enough about their organization to, to speak, speak to that. But I think they would be prudent because this one butts up almost right, you know, on 91. Yeah, I think they wouldn't would... want anything like that, but they have their adjoining properties they can utilize along the lines if they wish to, I suppose. So, George, your point's probably right because the other, there's uh, regulations as the hunting near public area, so 91. And then if it went to the, the if it goes to the uh, Preservation Trust, that would encroach their area to, to be able to hunt because they need a certain buffer so that's why this this is uh they this would probably be best suited for them because it creates a, a safety buffer around their other properties and like peter said it's it's a duck habitat and i'm sure they'll promote that because they i believe they uh purchase outside game and that type of thing and uh and uh uh boost up the uh, game pop game bird population in the meadow so that's i can see how that works there's also what you're, what you're saying they would be prudent about being they'd have to be near 91 if they did any uh shooting well yeah they, they wouldn't be near that you're right this creates right. actually exactly. creates the buffer okay and the house and the whole bit yeah yeah, I'm thinking if we put a condition in but i don't think we need to with this condition. there's regulations already on it Right. Hunting regulations. And I don't think we're in a position to put conditions on for an 824. Correct. We only I generally do recommendations or suggestions. Really, Peter? We, Rich, we just say yes or no, sort of, to the council. Uh, yeah, can't put conditions on. We're and uh, also, I mean, we're here to give constructive comment, aren't we? Sorry, Tony. We're here to give constructive comment, and I think that's yeah. what this is all about. And I have a question for Peter. 
Are there any more like this, Peter? Where'd this come from? Yeah, as they say, this is a, a bit of an oddity out there. I was, um, at, last year I started to put together a list of all of the open space in town and I never finished the task, but I, I feel pretty confident in saying this is the only town of Weathersfield holding um, in the meadows, so to speak. So uh, it is unusual. And I, uh, when I did see that initially, I was curious as to what the history of it was and how we ended up with it. Um, I think we've had other opportunities to take other properties in the meadows and have passed uh, on that. Um, I mean, and fortunately we have these two organizations that step in and play that role um, to be stewards of these properties. So uh, I have to have that as well. the narrative that Paul O'Keefe gave us anyway, referencing that they're 88 years of experience in conservation management and lands within his letter of February 7th of 21. He says that they own 38 other properties in the Great Meadows um, since 1933, I think. We have uh, working agreements with Anderson Farms, Winding Brook Farms, Great Meadow Conservation Trust, and they manage all of the Goodwin College properties. Most of us don't even know Goodwin College has 400 acres down in the Meadows, and it's with compliments that we are receiving those. Um, for mass appraisal purposes for exempt properties like this, it's pretty much handled, as Rich was saying, in a low profile way. Uh, every five years, they just, uh, because they're non-taxable, they're not scrutinized much. And um, that assessment, I think, would be something that would have to be revisited. And that's, I'm bringing up the question because I'm not sure if 30,000 for, a, I assume they don't, they have limited funds. Um, granted, we'd love to get more money, the better. But the bottom line is, is it fair and reasonable? Uh, I, I would just give that as a constructive comment because I assume they do have limited funding and there might other be other opportunities for their funding to do uh, other community effort. So uh, those are my thoughts, but I, I just want to give the committee, uh, the, the whole commission uh, reference to both of those narratives by Paul O'Keefe, it's very well done. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or comments on this? Yeah, Rich, Rich David Drake again. Uh, I'm going to think back. This was 10, 15 years ago when I was on a town council. This this property was on a list of uh, properties to be looked at, to be sold. It was like a half a dozen to look at. And at the time, if I recall, they looked at this and they didn't see any advantage or disadvantage to get rid of it, keep it or get rid of it. So they just left it. It was really, the money was minimal, didn't, it made no sense to get rid of it or even just to keep it, so they just left it. But this was looked at probably 15 years ago. Okay. So thanks. it has been looked at before. And again, I'm looking at this too, right? I mean, $30,000 is nice, I guess, but I don't know. If, if for me, if it, give up 15 acres of land for $30,000, I guess it's something, but if, if nobody in town could ever walk on it again, or, you know, if you step on it to call the police, I, I'm not sure if that's worth that, you know, very little open space around. And of course, this is lousy open space, but, and, uh, you know, <laughs> 30,000 doesn't excite me, to be honest with you. Peter, I don't know, right, is, next, is this, op is it public comment or no? No. Okay. I mean, would, could we put, ask, well, we have no, we can't ask for stipulations, just comments. Again, I'd like to see someone's, the Great Meadows Trust, I think, would let people walk on it. That's what, to me, I think the other one would probably say no, but I don't know. Again, we're, we don't have that information. But we're just providing, I guess, some guidance. So we really don't count. Yeah, I mean, I, I think other than should the town keep it or should the town sell it? Anything else that we would have to say is just kind of commentary. Right. Yeah, again, it's a business decision, what they want to do. Yeah. All right. Does anybody want to make a motion to, you know, start a conversation here? Mr. Chairman, George will make a motion to recommend to the town council that they accept this, uh, what do you want to say, this uh, uh, sale of land 
to uh, the game club. I'd okay. second that, George. Is that the way we want to phrase it, Peter? That makes sense. Well, that's what that's ultimately what they want to do. So I think that's um I'll that's second that. Okay. All right. Motion made and seconded. Does anybody have any any comments or uh, anything else they want to say about it? Well suggested. This is David Drake, and my only comment is of Ghost State Game Club, but basically uh it's it's gone from public use. That's all. But I guess that's okay. Probably nobody uses it. If it goes to Great Meadows Trust, it's probably open to the public. If it goes to the game club, it won't be be gone for thirty grand to me. And thirty grand is nothing, nothing. So Can we say I, I, go ahead. thank you. I definitely understand what you're saying, Dave. I um, and I was thinking so much of what everybody expressed uh, today. I just want to say that in. In uh, Paul O'Keefe's letter, he does say, we have working agreements in place with Anderson Farms, Winding Brook Farm, and I underlined Great Meadow Conservation Trust. So it sounds like they, that this organization is working with, with a lot of these other organizations. So that, makes, that reassures me. And it was a bid, so they probably didn't call each other up and say, hey, what's going on? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Right. If, if they had done that, there'd be a hundred dollars and a two dollar bid. One hundred and one hundred and one hundred and one. Yeah, but again, I, I know what you're saying. But the two different groups, they have two different. The Great Meadows Trust is an open space thing, but the the uh, other group is a. I'm going to say it's kind of a business, the game club. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to. Whatever you guys do, it doesn't make that much difference to me because I've never walked out there myself ever. But I, I, I'd vote no to this myself because I think for thirty grand, it's nothing. I'd rather have the Great Meadows Trust have it. They, they it takes away your chance of one day possibly walking that earth. Well, I'm with you, but I'm just saying, if this was <laughs> in twenty dollars, years, you know, well, if this was millions of dollars, be one thing. But it's thirty grand. We pissed away, and it's not thirty grand. is nothing. You know, three houses but taxes. there is a tax base, so that's it. But they will be paying taxes on the property yeah. as well. So what are they going to What are they going to pay on thirty grand? Well, we have the trust pass to get on the property if the trust owns it anyway. So, <laughs> so somewhere probably. You can go down there tomorrow, Dave. What's that? You can go down there tomorrow. <laughs> I guess. I guess. Yeah, get I guess, a, plank, get a picnic basket. Yeah. <laughs> it. it there, there's one comment that I would like to make on some of the comments that have been uh, issued here, and and that is, uh, uh, you know, there's one of us that, that has concerns about keeping this open for public use, but from what you know, what we've been told as the record on this property, it seems to be environmentally sensitive, and the prop you know the 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 proposition of having uh you know people walk around and trample on and so forth this this piece of property uh doesn't appear to be all that environmentally sound and uh it, it would appear that the you know this the strongest uh bidder here uh kind of ha has has a, a record and resources uh, that would enable it to uh, keep this property uh, essentially in a, in a you know preserved in its natural state, and uh, uh, I think that that uh, that is that's an important value, and I think that kind of rises above the you know, the whole issue of, of, you know, the public use, because I think there's a greater or a, a, as great a public interest in keeping this parcel uh, in, uh, you know, in a natural, you know, preserved state, uh, as opposed to seeing what damage could be done by having hordes of, potentially hordes of people trampling on it. So, uh, I think both, you know, both arguments may be far-fetched, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, that that's my uh, that's my mouth's worth of input on on that issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Does anyone else have any thoughts on this before we if move I, toward a vote? Ask, are we asking, are we making the motion, the motion's on the table, I don't think it's been seconded, but are we, um, do we have a choice? Shouldn't we leave that to the town council if they want to give it to one organization, sell it to one or the other? Are we just here to give a recommendation about the disposition of town property? Is that right, Peter? I, no, I, well, since they've given you the specifics, I think that all of that is within your purview to re report upon. So um, if they just wanted to know if they should sell it in general, then they probably would have done that before the bids came in um, just to get the, get the ball rolling. So uh, I think you have all of this information available to you and they're seeking some level of, um, you know, guidance or um, report. So I think it's, it's certainly open for you to do that. It sounds like both organizations will maintain all the land that they do have. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're lucky to have both of them in town. Is George's motion seconded yet? Yes, Jim seconded. Yeah, Jim. So there's a motion to recommend they go ahead. Right. You ready, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, that was your motion to go ahead with the sale of the property of the game club. Okay. okay that's Anything all we got to do, right? That's it. We don't have to vote on it, do we? Yeah, we do. We do. Okay. Yeah, it, it's an action of the commission to vote on it. Mr. Chairman, it's me, Hazim. Yeah. I'm going to have to recuse myself from voting on this topic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Mike Vera well, is Mr. here, so, so we still have nine. I am. Um, all right. So the, the motion was made to um, give a positive referral back to the town council to sell the property to the game club been made and seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Dave, were you no or? Go on, Dave. Uh, I, was, I, I be honest, I, I'm going to leave it. I'm just going to not vote. But I, I'll vote yes, but I, I would probably just say they could do whatever they want to do. I, again, I, I think either group could handle it just as well. I prefer the other group, but I guess 30 grand is 30 grand. So I'll vote yes. I mean, to me, either yeah, one would be fine. 30 grand doesn't mean anything nope. to, to the town. So, you know, it doesn't mean okay. anything. So pick one group no over pressure, another. Dave. You know. No, no, it's not, it's not that big a deal because I'll never be on the property anyways. Dave's got a good point. If we had okay. passive recreation, we'd be able to walk on all the land down there. It'd be great at okay. certain times of the day or certain hours of the week or maybe just on weekends. But I mean, I mean, I just think the idea is someone walks, goes, drives down around the corner, walks on with his dog to take a leak, and someone calls and he's arrested. It just seems to be a shame. But that's, I, I know that would never happen, but I'm just, you know, but I'm fine. I'll vote well, yes. It's not the biggest. Well, I think it depends on who's taking the leak, whether it's the person or the dog. I, mean, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, but, you, uh, go. you know, I'm just oh. saying either group is fine. Uh, you know, I'm fine. I'll vote yes. It's better than the horse. Okay. Better than the horse back <laughs> in 1972. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if the town went the other way around, it wouldn't make any difference to me, to be honest with you. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Before we get too far off the rails, um, move to item 3.2, 824 review uh, of the five year capital improvement program. And I Assume we have Derek Greger, town engineer, here to present that for us. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman okay. and the commission. Um, as stated, my name is Derek Greger. I'm the town engineer. I'm here tonight with Robert Turnson, who is the vice chairman of the Capital Improvement Advisory Committee. Um, for those of you who don't know, that committee is comprised of five residents. Uh, each year, they review CIP projects requests from department heads in the following eight categories, drainage, pavement maintenance, fire safety, sidewalks, town buildings, school buildings, parks and rec, and then economic and community development. This year, their target was a $900,000 total um, with recommendations for an additional $100,000 if funds were available um, once it got to town council in the budget. So I believe you all have packets with a lot of detailed information. 
Um, tonight, my plan is just to go through attachment A, which is the list of recommended projects by category. I'm gonna go through that list, give a brief description of each project. Uh, feel free to stop me if you wanna ask any questions. Um, I just wanna make you aware that, that what you see there is not all the project requests. Uh, we had quite a few more. These are only the ones that were recommended by CIA, CIAC uh, for upcoming fiscal year. So I'm gonna start uh, with the first category, which is drainage. Uh, that first project is called down, town dam repairs for design. The recommended amount is $50,000. Uh, the background on this is in 2016, uh, we had eight town dams inspected by a consultant. Four of them required some minor, minor repairs. Most of that included uh, tree and stump removals, erosion controls, pipe joint repairs, things of that nature. So these funds are to retain a consultant to begin the design and permitting process and to also go towards uh, starting construction on whatever dams we can get started based on uh, what their estimates come in at once they do some of the work. Second project is replacement of Copper Mill Road culvert over Golf Brook preliminary design. Recommended amount is $20,000. Um, in 2020, this past year, we had a consultant inspect seven bridges. Um, based on those inspections, their number one priority was the Spring Street culvert. However, uh, the town has been given about a million dollars in state grant and aid funds that's going to go towards a project for uh, drainage and park amenities there. So that one we've thankfully already have funded. This request is for priority number two on their list. Um, this particular culvert has an estimated service life of less than 10 years. It was originally identified in 1995 to alleviate flooding potential. Um, it hasn't been done yet, so we still have that issue with potential for flood. Um, with this, the intent is we're going to seek state and local bridge program funds uh, for replacing the culvert. And the request this year is to retain a consultant to do preliminary engineering, um, which is uh, re required or recommended before putting in an application into that funding program. So. This is to get the ball rolling on this project. Um, the third project under drainage is the same culvert. Uh, this is for final design and construction. The estimated cost for construction at this point is about $600,000 with design and uh, the cost of the construction work. Uh, the state local bridge program funds 50%. So we estimate the town's gonna need to come up with about $300,000 to do the work. So. This request is just to begin funding that match that the town's gonna to need to come up with. Um, when we do apply, if it is selected, we're gonna to need to come up with the funds um, rather soon. So this will kind of get us going on that. So we're not looking for all those funds in, in one year. Um, we're just trying to look out ahead a couple, couple years, two to three years. Next category is pavement maintenance. The first item is the road and parking lot evaluations and asset management software. Recommended amount is $50,000. What we've done historically is the town every five years evaluates all our roads, all local roads. This was last done in 2016, so we're due for another evaluation. The parking lots in town were last evaluated in 2002. So the request here will provide a consultant to go out and update all our pavement condition indices ratings that we have for all the roads, which helps us um, when we're planning out our paving programs going forward to determine where, where the most needs are as far as road conditions and also with our um, CIP planning purposes and uh, coordinating with utility companies. Um, the request includes an upgrade of our outdated road management software. We have software we've been using probably, I'd say 15 to 20 years now, it is no longer supported. This will allow us to buy a cloud-based system that will be utilized for managing our road assets, but it also has modules available for traffic signs and sidewalks um, which is something we hope to be looking at in more detail as we go forward. So it'll encompass, it'll have more ability, um, but this is something that uh, we're due for and it really is a good time to get a, a refresher. Over time, the roads deteriorate quickly. So it's always good every few years to just get another look at it so we can plan ahead going forward. Second project is the Straddle Hill, Hill Area Road Settlement. It's $25,000 request. Um, you may remember this from last year. There are some drainage and sanitary sewer trenches that are settling throughout the neighborhood. This includes Straddle Hill, Silo Drive, and Willow Street, and some of the adjoining roads. Um, the MDC and the, the town, we both did TV inspections. Uh, the pipes actually look very good structural condition. We think the issues might be related to uh, installation and backfill material that was used when they were installed many years ago. 
and this, these roads are going to be coming up for on the paving program, I anticipate, uh, in, in a future year, and we need to address the settlement issue first. So these are for funds to hire a consultant to do field investigations, uh, make some recommendations to us as to how to do complete repairs, and then uh, also complete repairs in Lower Straddle Hill and Scott's Way. Uh, this is the section of road where we get the most complaints and the most need. So this will go towards um, some of the funding that was put to the project last year. Derek, George, Oikel, uh, how come on this, the MDC doesn't take much in the way of responsibility for the settlement of those 40 year old roads? That, that's still being discussed. Uh, they had paid for their inspections of their TV uh, pipe. We had paid for ours. Um, both, both systems look good. So that's a conversation we'll have further with them once we identify what the issues are and what the costs are going to be to repair. The issues are a little different. Their trenches seem to be settling, almost the entire trench is settling, whereas with the drainage, it's potholes forming at periodic intervals. So they are a little different. But um, yeah, that's a discussion we're going to revisit with MDC once we just have more information and we just haven't gotten there yet. Okay. I hope they take more responsibility. I'll be talking to one of these days, my neighbor up the street, Andy Kyle. Uh, you know, he's now the MDC rep. So we'll see what he's got to say about it. Okay. Uh, third item is traffic sign inventory. This is for a consultant. Um, in 2014, the Federal Highway Administration mandated that all municipalities implement and use an asset management system for traffic signs. Um, this is really to ensure they maintain the minimum retro ref reflectivity requirements. Right now, uh, we're not technically in compliance because we don't really have a formal uh, asset management system. So these funds are to retain a consultant to field locate all the signs we have in town. We estimate there are about 3,500 traffic signs. They're going to collect information on those signs and develop a, a database for us that we can use to manage the inventory. Um, if this kind of goes along with the asset management software I was talking about earlier. Um, if we got this data collected, then we would have the software available to uh, add on and kind of help us manage the signs. So we know we can plan our projects going forward and bring the town into compliance in that respect. Next category is fire safety. Fire station two, architectural design for addition, $25,000. Um, currently firehouse number two, well, as far as I understand, none of the firehouses have locker room facilities for female firefighters. Uh, at this time, the fire chief is asking for funds to get an architect on board to design a building addition um, for those facilities to meet uh, standards regarding equity. Uh, they do have a lot of female firefighters, and uh, this was the first firehouse he selected for this work. So that is to go to an architect to start a design here so we can figure out what the cost of construction will be. The next item, fire station one, two, and three exhaust extractors. All of these uh, fire stations we have now don't have any automatic fan system to extract vehicle exhaust, particularly when the vehicles are in the bays. Um, it's a safety issue. So these funds will be for installing extractor systems in, in the bays at all three of the stations. Next category is sidewalks. Um, if you've been around, I come to you every year to talk about sidewalk ramps and ADA detectable warning panels. Uh, town is required by the Department of Justice and ADA standards to upgrade sidewalk ramps, uh, particularly when we're doing road work such as paving and reconstruction. So in recent years, we've been uh, utilizing these funds, these capital funds for improving the ramps along the paving program um, in other areas where we feel it's necessary. Uh, we also expect there's going to be some recommendations coming out, the, coming out from the town's bike ped plan that's currently being developed. And also we have some Yukon students doing a project for us where they're looking at uh, safety improvements at 14 different intersections and expect there might be some of these types of improvements with that as well. So this $65,000 request is for funding for the next fiscal year for that. Uh, George Eichel here, uh, Derek again. You know, I feel this way every year. Uh, the ADA, federal ADA requirements for those ramps and where you're, you and the town is providing them every time we do construction on the adjoining roadway. And uh, yet I feel we're not applying enough of this sidewalk money and sidewalk money, whatever we have in town 
to improving various areas of the community sidewalk wise. So it concerns me that this is where we put a lot of our money because the feds require it. But that's just my comment and uh, I don't know what can be done about it. And maybe I shouldn't be bother wasting time talking. Well, Mr. Oracle, I, th I think as you're aware, um, we do do sidewalk inspections. The property owners here in town are responsible for maintenance and repairs. I do have a part-time sidewalk inspector that that's one of his duties is to do inspections to get the, you know, the sidewalk system uh, upgraded, but that, you know, just takes time. So we do what we can. Um, I did just have a meeting with the um, advisory committee for people with disabilities last night to talk about ADA improvements. Um, we have spent about $250,000 over the last two years on sidewalk and ramp improvements. So there's definitely work going on. Um, certainly there's a lot more to do. Well, you're doing a good job in various parts of the community on those, those uh, Connor uh, locations. Uh, and I, I'm pleased you're doing that. But again, the concentrating on that uh, to the non sidewalk work elsewhere in town bothers me. That's all. And for example, I know you have an inspector, but he's often used on other things and it, it, you have inadequate help to do this kind of work and the sidewalks in town are deteriorating. And I say it every year this time, again, once more, sidewalks on my street at Clearfield Road are falling apart and, uh, you know, down below me and then not being repaired. And you have to have people that follow through because many people that don't repair their sidewalks, many do, uh, with a strong insurance influence in this region. And uh, people do get their sidewalks repaired because they might maybe sue. But the point is that the town has to follow up on the people that don't bother getting them repaired. And uh, it bothers me we don't have adequate staff to do that, particularly right here in my street for Four, uh, four houses away from me, and I walk it all the time as I walk a mile a day. Anyway, sorry to go into all that with everybody, but I have to say it over here. Okay, thank you. Uh, next category is town buildings. <clears throat> First item is roof consultant uh, re contract renewal. The amount is $73,747. Uh, this is a request to have Tremco, who's been our, our on call contractor for ongoing roof maintenance and minor repairs. Uh, this is to fund the first year of a new five-year contract with them. Uh, from my understanding, they've been very responsive and uh, serving the needs of the physical services department very well in the past. The second item is uh, root, roof routine maintenance, $25,000. Uh, this is funds for having our contractor available to complete roof repairs when needed. These are more substantial repairs than those that are in the on-call contract in the previous item. Um, so there's usually money put aside for uh, something more significant that might need to be done at different locations. Next category is school buildings. First item is replacement of Charles Wright portable unit. It's a $105,000 request. Um, you re may remember last year, there was a request to replace the Highcrest school portable units. Um, that was done by uh, this past year by our physical services department staff. Um, so here at Charles Wright, we knew this was going to be coming up this year. This is another unit that's been abandoned due to roof leaks and it's causing mold and is also not very well insulated. Um, the school does need this additional uh, classroom space. So this is a request to have the work again done by our physical services department um, you know, at a lower cost than bidding um, to restore that particular unit. Derek, congratulations on getting these main, free maintenance issues taken care of with town staff instead of outside contractors. And I congratulate you for doing that. Well, I can't take credit for that. That was town manager and director of physical services, but yeah, they, well, they made that pass it on to him. So we'll do. Okay, next item is replace the three roofs at Highcrest School, $140,000. Um, these are funds that will supplement the $100,000 that was allocated last year. It allows for a replacement of two of the three roofs at the school that have leaks and need repair. Um, at least we can get two of the three done and then we expect there'll be a future request to finish the third roof. The next category is parks and recreation. First item is the nature center, the concrete sidewalk and ADA ramp for $25,000. Uh, 
This is a safety issue that exists along the ADA ramp and sidewalk uh, at the main access to the Nature Center. Uh, these funds will uh, be sufficient to complete all the repairs needed. It's a safety issue and something that uh, Parks and Rec is looking to address. Uh, sec second item is community center parking lot for $25,000. Um, this is just an issue. We have a lot of potholes and uh, poor pavement conditions at the community center. And this is uh, causing safety issues, uh, particularly in the areas in the parking area. So these funds are, uh, will be used to at least repair the worst areas in town. I, I'm sorry, in the parking lot at this point, most of the lot is in pretty good shape. So it's just limited areas that are in bad shape. I think there's a plan included in your packet that shows all the areas that need repair, but um, at least a partial funding like this will allow us to get some of that work done um, before someone gets hurt. We've gotten a lot of complaints. Uh, Eric, it's George Oikel again. Uh, you're taking money out of the uh, Mill Woods parking lot and putting it somewhere else? Why? Yeah, uh, I was going to get That is that. awful down there right now. And I think you can keep that intact and in the spring by just putting some more gravel in there. But I'd like to see that paved some one of these days. And I hate if you got money in, in a budget, even if it's not quite enough to do some paving down there in Mill Woods. Well, that, that yeah. the, scope, the scope of work down there is a little different. But I'll talk, let me get through the list here. And I was going to talk about that at the end. The okay, recommendation. fine. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring it up. I didn't want to lose it somewhere. I had a note on it. Okay, next item is the Greenfield softball field fence. Uh, fence is over 20 years old and requires continuous maintenance. These funds are to replace the wire and gates only. Um, from my understanding, the contractor feels the existing post can remain. Um, so there's a recommended $28,000 allocation for that. Next item is community center lobby hallway of flooring and window treatment. Um, this is something that's been on our list for a while. The carpet and window treatments in the lobby in the main hallway are approximately 25 years old. Uh, carpet is buckling, seams are starting to come apart and it's becoming very difficult to clean. Uh, the window treatment hardware is starting to wear out and uh, blinds have really exceeded their life expectancy. So these funds would be used to replace the carpet with a tile or a concrete type flooring and also to install uh, new window treatments in these areas. Our last category is economic development. Uh, first item is a facade improvement program. The amount is $50,000. Um, historically, this has been a very successful program in town. Uh, it's used to provide matching funds for property owners to complete facade improvements on commercial buildings. Um, we've done approximately 40 projects since 2005. Uh, so this is a request to um, supplement the funds that are available for these types of projects. Last item is the plan of conservation and development, $60,000. Um, the, this plan is, the update for this plan is due in 2023 and the affordable housing plan that is part of it is due in 2022. Um, in addition, the 2006 Silas Dean Highway revitalization plan needs to be updated. So this request is to have funds available to hire a consultant to update all three of these plans. Um, the, this is a partial funding request for this year. Uh, the CIAC has committed to fund the remainder next year uh, to make it a whole project, but um, in conversations with staff, uh, we felt that we could start the project with this allocation. So that's what they recommended at this time. So the total for all this, these were the base recommendations, which total $896,747. Um, the one additional project for the additional $100,000 is the Four Season unit at the town hall and library. Um, this unit provides primary heating, cooling and ventilation for the newer section of the library and part of town hall. It was installed in 1996. It was not designed for current con building configuration. It causes uneven heating and cooling. Um, so funds are for replacement of this unit and the associated ductwork that goes with it. So with that, the expanded total is $996,747. Um, with regard to Mr. Oikel's comments, there were some additional recommendations from the CIAC. Um, the first one, was to transfer $25,000 from an existing CIP account that was uh, put aside as a partial payment for the Millwoods Classic Little League field improvements and move them to the Greenfield Softball Field Fence Project. Um, the request was $53,000. They recommended above that we allocate $28,000 this year and then transfer that $25,000 from the other project to make it a whole $53,000 and get the project done. 
um, I have all the money available to get the project done. Um, the other recommendation was to transfer $35,000 from a CIP account that's for the Millwoods parking lot construction. Um, this was intended for a project to install a new gravel parking lot adjacent to the tennis courts out there. Uh, it wasn't related to any of the existing parking lots. It was for a new one that was going to be installed. Um, being that that's also just partial funding, uh, they were recommending that we move it to the basketball court repairs at Farms Village and Old Reservoir Road. Um, that is not on the list, but that was something that was requested by our Parks and Rec Department. They have been doing uh, similar types of projects that have been very successful in recent years. So that would fully fund that project and allow them to move forward with it. So that is the whole list. I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone might have. All right, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Want to make a motion on that one? Sure. That we we uh, give a affirmative affirmative recommendation to the uh, request. Is that proper? Second. Okay. Yep. From George. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll just throw in my annual comment that I, you know, I, I wish. We were spending more on maintaining what we have. Um, you know, I, I think George can back me up on this. That the uh, nine hundred thousand is probably exactly the same amount that was budgeted for capital improvements thirty years ago. And uh, I'm amused to see the uh, replacement of the Charles Wright portables on here. Uh, my daughter is going to be 25 at the end of the month. When she was in fifth grade, uh, the roof of the Charles Wright portable fell in on her class. Uh, you know, so that was, I don't know, 18 years ago, it was already uh, going through its first life. And uh, now we're giving it a second one. Does anyone else have any uh, comments on this before we vote? I have a couple of questions anyway, Mr. Chairman. Sure, Tony. Um, I didn't know that you had spent so much, Derek, on, on the ADA compliance. So thanks for bringing that to our attention. Uh, the community center generates revenue. Uh, was there, has there any been, been any discussion, Mr. Churchin, maybe, or, or Derek, if, uh, if, if the community center was looked at in a different way and, and looked at maybe over a capital improvement to add more functions after the pandemic's over to bring more revenue to offset some of the expenses? Has that been part of any of the discussions? I, I haven't personally been involved in any of those discussions. Um, there, there may have been. <clears throat> I know there's a larger plan to do a, a more comprehensive look at the facility. Um, and that's been discussed for a few years. I think these improvements are just more, they felt were immediate need due to safety issues. Um, and, and something also that you know, once we do get past the pandemic, just the way it looks right now is getting to the point where it needs a, a, some refreshing. And uh, I think that's part of the window treatments uh, to make it appealing and make it something that people will want to utilize. Um, so that's a good question, but I, I can't speak to that because I, I haven't been involved. Okay. The, um, the GIS database that you referenced in the extensive inventory reports that you hope to achieve, I think on signage and a variety of other things, does that interrelate at all with any type of a land use software that might be available to use for the building department and the town planner? Has that been on the radar or is there something in place that I'm not aware of? Uh, we, we do have a newer software we're going to now um, called Municity, which is shared between the departments. It's primarily permitting software, but it does allow us to track uh, complaints. Uh, sidewalk complaints are one, um, you know, any kind of permits that are approved for it whether it be building permits, uh, right-of-way permits, or, or planning zoning and wetlands permits. So that's utilized for helping us manage land use for the most part, or at least property management. Um, you know, as far as this, this is more robust software that's specific mostly for doing uh, our inventory of roads, because we have 105 miles of roads and trying to maintain that, you know, we spend about a little over a million, million and a half per year on paving. So we don't have a lot to spend, so we try to use, utilize it as efficiently as possible. So this 
software allows us to do different analyses on it to look at different things and come up with the most cost effective and um, you know program that will make the most sense for the community. So I think that this particular software just has more specific engineering tools uh, available to it and is somewhat specific to our use in our department. Sounds like it's desperately needed. So uh, Peter, my question, another question for the facade program that we have. Um, does, does, have we ever had a, a request for a vacant building to utilize the facade program? And does it stimulate occupancy at all? Has the EDIC worked on that approach uh, to let's say the coal vest or the nidets or any of the big plazas? Has that ever come into play on, on stimulating some activity and getting occupancy in some of the vacant buildings we have? Uh, as Derek mentioned, we've, um, we've initiated probably over 40 projects now, um, many of which um, were specifically done as an incentive to get the space occupied. It was part of a larger package. We have not had um, luck with some of the larger plazas, given the scope of those and the you know limited resources. We can only give fifty thousand dollars to a to a individual project. So, um, but there are numerous examples where um, you know our small investment, um, in some cases, yielded uh, ten times the investment uh, that the town made. So, uh, there are plenty of examples like that, just not with the larger shopping centers because of the scale of those projects. And, um, Derek, you did mention the bikeway might be on some of these projects agendas. So you have some allocation, at least you put it on record that because the bikeway has come before us in planning and zoning in the past. And I think that's a good positive for the community. That's all I, all my questions I have. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to say? All right, if not, motion has been made and seconded to give a positive referral. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Eric, uh, can we make uh, George the sidewalk czar for the Clearfield uh, Road area. <laughs> Put this to bed. I mean, so we don't have hey, I think I'm, I'm on the bike area. and walking committee. That's enough. Only on Clearfield Road. No, I got the whole town. You could get a desk right next to Derek in his office. Yeah, I know. <laughs> one day, Mr. Roy, one day. <laughs> you put him right over there to your left. Yeah. Bike and walk. <laughs> we got that coming at the Commission, you know, guys. <laughs> right? All right. Next uh, minutes of the February 17th, 2021 meeting. Uh, does anybody have any comments? I make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman, George. Okay. All right. Is there a second? Second. All right, seconded by Jim. I saw Dave trying, but he's muted. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I'm abstaining. Sorry. Okay, Ryan's abstaining. I abstain. Uh, staff reports. Uh, just a couple of little things. Um, we're, as George mentioned, we are making um, a significant headway on the bicycle and pedestrian plan. Uh, we're at the point now where we're um, hashing out the various recommendations. I think we've got another meeting uh, in March where probably we will get through those recommendations. So at some point uh, in the near future, uh, we will probably uh, come before you and just give you a, a preview of the final recommendations before they get uh, in a uh, final draft format in case there are concerns or questions that we need to address. So just to a heads up on that. We do not have any pending applications. So uh, at this point, I think we can um, safely uh, cancel the next uh, regularly scheduled meeting. And then lastly, uh, we are um, hopefully by the end of the week going to finalize the proposed changes to the fence regulations. So uh, that will be coming up uh, for a public hearing at some point, probably uh, in, in maybe early May or um, probably early May. Um, so just a, just a heads up on 
on a couple of those things. Uh, you may have seen finally that the um, tilted kilt is uh, now partially demolished. Um, so um, you should see work on that. We're also getting ready to issue the um, Popeye's uh, restaurant permit uh, anytime and they do plan on working uh, through the remainder of the winter. So just a couple of um, things to point out for you. All right. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, next item, public comments on general matters of planning and zoning. Is there anyone? Is this, uh, Peter, when? This is public comments, yes. This is my time? This is your, mo this yep. is your big moment. I'm raising my hand. <laughs> 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 okay, go ahead. Just, I didn't see uh, the button on the on the thing. <laughs> yep. Uh, my name is Micah Kerr. I'm 553 Maple Street here in Wethersfield. Lived here for, I don't know, maybe 14 years now, I think. Um, yeah, I, I would like to ask the town to add provision to the zoning to allow for microbreweries in uh, a commercial properties in town, as I intend to bring a permit in front of the town as soon as I'm legally able to. I'm ready to go um, in all aspects, except for I think there's no mechanism for me to apply for it this time. And I'm happy to discuss it. I know that one of your members has some brewery experience himself, so he can probably either corroborate my um, comments, but um, I'd love to, I don't know how this works from here, but um, specifically, the state rules on breweries have become really simplified, meaning there's only one type of production license and that the town gets to decide where that use can happen. Uh, the state has additional liquor permits, which allow for the opening of a patios uh, in addition to what the primary license has. And I believe in many of the commercial districts as it is now, I'm uh, looking at your the zoning um, ordinance, uh, the zoning plan of zoning right now, zoning regulations, that's the word. And they, um, you know, they identify the various zones. Most of the commercial properties have very few things that are permissible by right. Most are, require a site plan and a committee review, I think is it, um, I forgot the term, the CUSP. So I don't think that's a problem. I think you can include breweries in it, but I, I would encourage uh, the town to allow for these uses in, in any place that you allow a restaurant uh, effectively, because in today's day, that's what a craft brewery is. Uh, it's effectively a restaurant, but the only thing in our kitchen is beer. So um, I don't know, I'd love to have questions and comment conversations so that we can, you know, do something. But I, I have a, a project that I'm ready to go with in town. I've started meeting with the HDC um, as uh, I believe some of your faces look familiar from the other night. And I, I would love to figure out a way to make this happen as quickly as I can. Are there any neighboring towns that have something like what you're asking for? There are. Or yes. So specifically, neighboring towns is there are, gosh, at least three breweries in Hartford. There are, I don't think there's any in Newington technically yet. There is one in Rocky Hill. There is, um, is it two in Glastonbury, Vieira? I know there's at least one. Um, yeah, at least one. Yeah, he, he might know better than me because I don't have the time to go to other breweries, but uh, <laughs> I just don't, unfortunately, he's a... The, the curse of owning a company. Um, but I do know that for Rocky Hill, I have their uh, regulations. I sent them into uh, Peter. And I, I actually recently was involved in a zoning application over there because I've been in the process of trying to open a property in Rocky Hill. Um, the specific verbiage they use in the zoning, uh, Peter, did you share that with the commissioners or no? No, they do not have that. Okay, so I will, um, I suspect, should I, sh should I share my screen maybe? If you have it handy, I can, um, I can let you co-host. That makes me a little nervous. Let, let um, I, uh, the, the, yeah, I don't, 
I, I don't have anything weird. I'm, I'm not weird, but yeah, I mean, if you, if it's not a comfortable thing, by oh, all means. Okay. Just, um, you are now a co-host. So if you want to share. Oh your... boy, it's a lot of responsibility. Okay. So I'm just going to open the file so that I can share directly to it. Um, I think I get to choose an individual file when I do this. Um, okay. So the specific. We'll do this. You've got the share screen function. I got to make it full screen, I think. Ah, all right. So I'm just going to show, I guess, that email, Peter. I don't think there's any reason I can't. That's what I'm just looking right now to confirm because I took screenshots out of it. Um, I don't, I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable because I get, I get that. Um, we have a very high threshold for discomfort on this commission. <laughs> can confirm. Oh, goodness, Rich. So, <laughs> while we're uh, looking for that, so the question yeah. I have, Peter, the question I have is that can a microbrewery right now come into town with a special permit? No, we as a special permit, or they just we just don't allow them right now at all. Yeah, we we talked about this at a couple of previous meetings. I. Okay. Uh, I wanted to sort of go down that route, but I think some of the members felt we needed specific regulations in place uh, in case there were concerns related to some of the different types of uh, liquor permits. So, um, okay, so we would need to amend under that theory. We would need to amend the regulations and add the use um, in in the appropriate zones in town, and then establish the type of permit that they would need to acquire to do that. So. That's kind of where we where we left off. Okay, I must have missed that meeting. Okay, thanks. Can you? Can I you mean, folks... it was it was a while ago. Yes. Can you, can you folks mean, see I, my email? Been... Barely. Yeah. Uh, is this yes. what we need? Does that help? Yes, I can see it. Okay, that works. All right. So this is an email I sent to Peter clearly four days ago. Um, I look at this in two ways. I'm a taxpayer here for a long time. <laughs> uh, and so therefore, obviously, we want to encourage business where it's appropriate. I also um, have a lot of background in doing stuff with planning and zoning. But um, so I have some familiarities with the way a town might look at some of this stuff. Um, typically, in the state of Connecticut, we just we describe a craft brewery as anything that makes under 15,000 barrels. And therefore, most any town that you look at, including Rocky Hill, um, and I want to say, uh, when I checked Berlin and Newington's, it said the same. They're, those towns have taken the boilerplate uh, description, uh, which if you look here in this email, I copied it directly. This is a screenshot of the Rocky Hill um, matrix for their zoning. And you can see uh, item five. Can you see my cursor? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, right. item five there says brewery producing up to 15,000 barrels. I think I just said gallons before, but I meant barrels per year and that is available in various zones within the commercial district. Uh, the town obviously has to choose what those zones are and the town certainly can change any aspect of this, but um, the state has recently consolidated all of the various alcohol codes. I'm sure you guys got some notifications on that. That was, well, I guess over a year ago now, but with COVID, it was just last week. Um, and in that all the manufacturer um, classes of permits have been boiled down to manufacturers, beer, or, or other non-beer products. So there's only one permit now that allows you to manufacture beer. And that permit has the same uses uh, no matter where you assign it. So the, the town can, of course, put conditions on that. And if you look at Rocky Hill, they do SP, SPA. That's the same as for you guys to have the CU, SPA. Um, it means they need a site plan and um, a special permit and a site plan approval is their acronym. And so that in order to get this kind of use on a property, even if it is zoned for it, it comes down to the folks that are sitting in your chairs to make a decision for what's right for your town. And I think that's important because in five years, what's right for the town today may not make sense. And, and certainly 20 years ago when opening a new, or I'll say 70 years ago when opening a new gas station, 
uh, everyone was super psyched for these, you know, for gas stations right off the highway. But nowadays we might realize it's a bad idea to put a gas station right next to some wetlands. You know, it's, it's uh, the folks in the position uh, the, the in town, such as yourselves, get to make that decision from your perspective as a resident today. And, and I think it's important for that. Um, it, it makes it harder for people like myself, uh, but I, as a guy doing it, I, I would say that's probably the way to go because I don't personally want to see a commercial use, you know, pop up in a zone it doesn't belong in. I, 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 I'm a big fan of zoning. Um, and if you see in the email I wrote to Peter, um, I wrote that um, the brewery use should be in the um, uh, village, in my opinion, uh, village business, uh, town center, I think what is GB is general business and BP is business park. Um, I think it, it's pretty viable in most of your business situations uh, in town. Places where it might not be is you may not want to put it in the same place where you would currently put, I think it's where you put a fast food restaurant type place, which is, uh, I think you call it regional business. Um, because it's a totally different use, but if somebody wants to open one there, I suppose you you can grant it to them. I have no judgment. Uh, but breweries more and more are about where people can go um, to, to hang out rather than just for production. So you, if you feel uncomfortable with 15,000 barrels, lowering that number I think is very reasonable. Um, if that's something that makes you uncomfortable because it makes it less of a industrial like heavy use and, and the individual permittee could ask for them to raise that in the future if it became an economic issue. Um, but yeah, I would, I would love to help in any way I can to get these provisions added to the zoning specifically for my use. I am concerned about village business for that. That's where I intend to come, come to you with a proposal. Uh, Micah, could you speak a little bit to you, you would like to produce uh, or manufacture beer, but you would also like to um, be able to uh, dispense and serve it. Could you could you explain how that works with state licensing and whether you need to have um, food, a food component to that? Yes. Yeah, Certainly. So at this moment, because of an executive order, which I can't remember the exact number of, um, I, I am required to have food. So in, if it were two years ago, um, gosh, it's actually a weird timeline. So with all the laws being condensed, there is, again, there's the only a single law. Um, I can happily forward that on to all the commissioners for you to see the description of a brewery manufacturing permit. Um, I think I have it. It's open in one of my windows right now, but I, I don't want to just click through all my stuff. <laughs> uh, so, um, but that permit allows for the manufacturer to sell at wholesale to licensed retailers, which is to say the beer produced on that property can be brought to Sammy's by right liquors and he can sell it. Right. Um, the beer that is also produced on that property can also be, uh, sold again to a retailer in the sense of a restaurant. So I could sell that um, beer to Lucky Lou's and or Old Town Tavern and they can sell that beer. So that's the wholesaling component. There is also a retailing component in the state law. And it is that uh, if somebody comes into your place, your brewery, your place of manufacture, they are able to buy some of your product to go home with. And this is uh, typically in, in the industry today, it means when you go to a, a brewery, you have a couple beers, you have some food because that's well built into the culture of it. Um, but And then you can take that, take a growler home, which is a, a, a resaleable container, take a four pack of cans home, much like you buy at a, pack, a grocery store. There is a limit to how much alcohol can be brought home. Um, it's not a package store. You can only sell your beer. Like if um, my brand is Boondoggle Beers, I can only sell Boondoggle Beers unless I brewed beer for another company, uh, say City Steam, which um, I definitely will never have to brew beer for them. They're way bigger than me. But if I ever brewed Naughty Nurse for City Steam, I could also sell that product out of my facility. Um, the third is you are able to operate as a 
beer bar, you can pour the beer that you made. So if somebody wants a sample, you can sell them a sampler. If somebody wants a pint, you can sell them a pint under the same rules as a, a regular, uh, the, you know, the license that Old Town has or what have you, I, I could sell the beer that I, I make in there. Um, so that's the, the selling. Now, when COVID hit, the executive order um, that Lamont put in made it so food was a requirement. And specifically, my understanding is it's not, you can't have, you can have food that is made on site. So a food truck is allowed. Uh, and, and so you could be open to sell beer if there's a food truck there. And you can only order the beer if you get food from the food truck, which is a, a very clumsy, but breweries have been making it work because that's because they're, they're trying to survive, right? Um, the other is if you have an in-house food option, you can obviously sell them food. And then there was a whole bunch of discussion about what is substant substantive food. So I think Lamont said that chicken wings weren't, it made some news. That's just, if you might recall that conversation, that's when this was all happening. Um, the, the food element here is currently in play. I will have to make food. Uh, I'm prepared to do so, but the executive order either will be made into law or will be uh, expire at some point, at which point you as a brewery have no food requirement in the current law. And it's outlined, everything I just said is outlined in some pretty clear paragraphs in the beginning of the applications for this license. So if you, I'm happy to share that uh, with you, Peter, and you can send it to all the commissioners and they can read, you know, heck, they can look over the whole thing. It's a public document on the state uh, liquor control board, um, but I'll, I'll make it easier and uh, send that over. But that, that should to describe, those also describes all the things I intend to do. <laughs> um, so the manufacture of is the primary goal, of course, but you you are going to sell it on site. And in general, breweries today in Connecticut, unless Anheuser-Busch decides to come to town and build a, a you know a billion dollar facility, they're they're going to focus on selling that beer on site where it's made because that's what people uh, the consumer wants today, uh, much like they did in the 1990s and that eventually died out and now it's back so any questions yeah. is that enough does that make sense peter was that good for the food good for me i think we would love to hear from the commission members of any thoughts um, reactions that kind of thing Yeah, if you want to unshare so that we can. Oh, shoot. Yeah, I show, forgot. Like, I was even doing that. Manage this a little better. Boy, how's that? Good. Well, that's much better. Thank I you. apologize. <laughs> yeah, does, uh, does anybody have any kind of uh, initial reaction? That they want I, to mean, I mean, I'm all for it. It's like it, it turns it like the reason why I like a brewery, the reason why I like it's just the concept is it's more of a, a destination, right? So it's not, it's not so much a you're putting another bank somewhere or um, doing something that's already there or a restaurant that people are just sort of, um, you know, haphazardly, you know, coming upon and then they just go in because they're hungry. Like a brewery, like the culture for the brewery in general is, you know, you, you plan your whole Saturday and you go, you hang out and then you're in the town center, you're, you're there and you're in town and you're, you know, going to all the other businesses that are nearby, especially if it's going to be in like a village business sort of area, like he's talking about. So, I mean, initially I like this kind of proposal because it's, you know, whether or not anybody has any opinions this way or that on, on a brewery in general, but like it is a destination, it is very popular, and it is something that's going to bring people to town more so than like uh, just like another restaurant or something that like maybe we already have. So I think that's why it sort of, I, I think very favorably of, upon this kind of thing. Peter, when did we actually talk about this? It's been a couple of years, hasn't it? I mean, how can we argue with a guy named Micah from Micah Brew? I mean, that, that alone sells the product. 
you know? No, it's it's a micro brewery. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the, the business name, name is also food. apropos, though. It is Boondoggle, okay. the expenditure of a great deal of time and resources on something that appears to have value but has none at all. So that's what I intend to do in the middle of the village. Has it been a couple of years, Peter, since we talked about it, or Mr. Chairman? We've talked about it a couple of times. Um, late last year and then um, probably a year before that, we've had um, several interested parties uh, approach us, but nobody has um, pulled the trigger or nobody's gotten uh, this far. So um, we talked about a couple of different scenarios. Um, and um, I think uh, Micah is now as close as anyone had been previously to um, maybe moving it to the next, um, next level. And before he did that, he wanted to just get a sense if there was uh, strong feelings um, uh, that he needed to be aware of before we, we go to the next level. So the, so the next level would be um, probably for, for Micah to submit an application and I can certainly work with him to fit it into the categories and the zoning districts here in town. He mentioned a couple of them. Certainly I think the town center um, which is where um, the Clearinghouse Auction Gallery property is located because we've had several uh, breweries uh, interested in going in there. No one has, has once again pulled the trigger. And then we've had several uh, in Old Weathersfield. So at least those two districts. Um, and then a couple of the other ones he mentioned are you know, more uh, manufacturing districts. So uh, as, a, as a, a beer manufacturer, it would potentially make sense to be in those zones uh, as well. So. I don't. Uh, I don't disagree uh, with the approach uh, that he's, um, you know, considering going forward with. Do you feel? Do you feel Rocky Hill's a good example? In the details that he gave you, or are you going to research a little bit other other communities? Yeah, I think it's just a matter of getting the getting the statutory definition so that you understand what a what a you know manufacturer a brewery manufacturer is, having that in the regulations, and then plugging it in. Um, because all uh, by special permit, because all of your alcoholic liquor licenses are uh, presently done by special permit. So, and then and then just plugging it into the use table. I don't know necessarily that you need, you know, much more uh, than that because the definition in the statute limits yep. the volume uh, that you can produce at a at a particular site. So you you would want uh, in your zoning code, I think in the email I highlighted, the first thing you would need to do is you need to add the definition of a brewery as a defined term, right? Because it's currently not there's I've done the document search. There's no mention of brewery in, in any way, shape, and form. Um, so you would have to add it as a as an item. And then as the then you'd have to add it as a sp special use in the, within the matrix of, I think it's only just the hospitality section, frankly. I don't think it makes much sense uh, to go too far broad from that, but yeah, the hospitality stuff can be done in um, many areas. If somebody wanted to open just a manufacturing brewery, I suspect uh, that's something that you can consider as well if there's industrial property. But again, that's where I'm, I'm saying that would be something that would be a pretty significant um, capital investment by a major company because there's too much uh, potential income to be made having a retail slash customer facing component when you're making the beer right there. I can, I don't have to ship it to New London to sell it to somebody at the ferry, I, which is what I'm doing now, <laughs> you know, so it's a lot more convenient to just pour it to your neighbors. I agree with Ryan. I think it would be a positive for the town. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember when we discussed that I don't remember how long ago it's been. I mean, COVID has kind of telescoped time and space for everyone. But, um, you know, and I think at the time, you know, we had kind of mused about some of the zones that it might be good in. Um, you know, the, I, I think the thing that we need to think about as we're dealing with that is, you know, getting a getting a clearer handle on what 15,000 barrels a year looks like. Um, I can help you, you know, with that right now. Well, I, I'm, I don't think we, I'm just saying that at that point, you know, when we're looking at different zones, you know, it, it might be something that, you know, is appropriate 
you know, for for an, you know a vacant factory building, but might might not be appropriate for in the middle of a strip shopping center. Right. Um, you know, the regional commercial zone, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule it out entirely because you have, you know, places like the the Red Lobster. You know that that could be. You know, that could be a very good location for it, even though it's, you know, not necessarily in one of the zones that you had identified. But I, I think, you know, the, the key thing from my perspective is to, you know, to have it be a special permit use just so that we can, you know, evaluate each location on a case by case basis in terms of, you know, size, intensity, you know, traffic impacts, parking impacts. Um, you know, the neighborhood that it's going into, but, uh, you know, I'm certainly willing to, uh, you know, entertain uh, amendment to the zoning regulations. And I think Peter's suggestion that, you know, Micah put something together and Peter work with it is probably the, you know, work with him on it is probably the, the best way to approach it rather than to you know, delegate to the commission to read your mind and guess what it is you want. Um, you know, I'd, I'd rather have it be proactive on the part of the applicant who's going to benefit from it. Yeah, I'm, I'd love to help. I just, I don't want to overstep and make an assumption, you know, as a resident, as a taxpayer, as a business owner, you're like, you start to get into this position, I might be wearing too many hats that I'm, I'm definitely, my opinions, what's it called, uh, corrupted. Uh, you know, I can't see the forest through the trees because I'm, it is literally my life. So, um, but yeah, for, uh, no, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think that, you know, when someone has a vision for proposing a use that's not currently contemplated by the zoning regulations, it's perfectly fine to wear the hat of, okay. you know, the applicant and the promoter to submit an application and, you know, explain it, answer questions and defend it. I guess the, you know, the, the, thing to bear in mind is that it would be a two-step process you get the you know you could theoretically get the you know the the zoning regulations amended and then either you decide not to go forward with it or you know we don't like the place that you've proposed but uh, you know at least we have to start somewhere yep so you're talking about a preliminary application right uh, rich uh, no, I mean, it, it could be an actual application if, you know, yeah. if, you yeah. know, if it's put together. I mean, it, it doesn't sound like, you know, it, it doesn't sound like it's extremely complicated because we probably wouldn't be drafting detailed performance standards in terms of, you know, how it would operate. It's more, you know, is this use permissible in the zone by the special permit? And then we you know, it, it's like, you know, the all the other alcohol-based uses. What is it you propose to do? What are you going to be your hours? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know that sort of thing. But but at least, you know, at the outset, amending the zoning regulations to allow us to get to the level of having that discussion seems like a pretty straightforward thing. Okay, good. Are you right? I mean, I, I have Anybody else? for my proposal uh, as a just as a, a discussion of timing um, for me uh, in this particular context, time will be of the essence for me. I know that that does, should never sway commissioners, but my goal in in coming today is partly to make this to be as um, as kind of quickly as possible because I've been delayed in my other attempts to do this. Uh, I was one of the um, folks interested in the auction house in the past. Uh, when that fell through and i've actually been in, interested in the property uh, i'm going to be working with now in the past but it was not for sale at the time um, and i most recently was doing the same in rocky hill and i'm now currently being delayed by an issue with the property not related to my use just related to um, the train tracks uh, that are now reactivated which made it complex so i'm i'm ready to put an application for the zone together i i can do what I, I did this at Rocky Hill already. You're welcome to reach out to Kim over there. She'll tell you anything, share everything, I'm sure. But I will, um, I'll send over an application to Peter as soon as tomorrow on the zoning 
change request uh, and then we'll that'll give us maximum discussion time i don't expect immediate action but if i can jump there then we'll get more discussion time and get everyone to give their feedback uh, i can also let you guys know what i intend to do but technically those two things should probably be just debated separately because the yep. adding this use to the zoning is a lot different than my specific plans for specific use within a specific zone so uh, I defer to you guys for that direction, but that was kind of my thought is I can get something to Peter as soon as tomorrow, uh, which is an actual proposal and I can, um, you know, then just let that go where it goes. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that makes sense. I mean, frankly, on, on something that's straightforward like this, that's probably the best way to proceed because it, more often than not, when, when we know too much about the site, we start micromanaging that in the context of the text amendment and right have to spend half the time untangling the two concepts <laughs> exactly i'm glad you get it because that's part of the thing that that can be challenging with with something like a completely new use you know yep micah if you can submit an application uh in the next week or two um may 4th is the a PNZ meeting that uh, we could get you on. We have some public notice requirements because of regulation changes. So yep. um, if you can do that, we can um, carve out uh, May 4th for the hearing on this. I'll get you an application tomorrow, but I will not formally submit it until you and I discuss, about, discuss it so we can refine it for a formal submittal. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the the whole issue on that is that when you're amending the zoning regulations, it has to be referred to the neighboring towns and to yep. the Capital Region Council of Governments for 35 days, not, you know, it, it's not that we don't want to see you in April, it's just we can't. Yep. What's interesting about that, Robert, is I went through that at Rocky Hill, and it was 30 days, and then a, a COVID thing made it 35, but it's still um it it, can, it delays the entire process an additional month for the permitter which i find to be sort of a, a real shame in a in a time that's already pretty tough to get a business going um i know it's and i i, I referred to i spoke to the director about that and she in, informed me that you don't need 30 days 35 days so i would only ask that the town contact the state, uh, excuse me, the regional planning, um, because when I spoke to them, I, I received different information and I can forward that email on to you, Peter, as I had to forward it on to Kim in Rocky Hill. Well, I think you can get out of the 35 days for outdoor dining applications. I don't know that it. Well, it was specifically to... for a zone change. A zone change is different than a regulation change. So yep. if the zone, if, the, if you're changing a zone, and it's not within 500 feet, you don't have to do the 35 day notice, but a regulation change that affects uh, zoning districts and throughout town, um, there is a mandatory 35 day waiting period by statute. So um, just uh, otherwise we would accommodate you much faster. Yeah, I, I'm going to. All right. I'll, I'll talk to you offline on that just in case, because it was actually I, it was a creation of a brand new zone is what I ended up doing. And she she said that that re, did not require 35 days. But it, that's that's a moot point. It doesn't it's that's offline conversation. That's a matter of the technicals. So. Well, and the executive orders will all be expired by then anyway. <laughs> I hope, I don't Knock on wood. <laughs> yes, let's yeah, just... <laughs> let's, let's not jinx it. Yeah. yeah, we we may actually get to meet some of our fellow commissioners, um, you know, before the end of 2021. I hope so, Pete. Really, to Peter and Rich, I hope we can get together re in real time. Yeah. Uh, from Zoom. All right. Anybody else on this subject before we move on? Uh, this, you right, know, thanks. Thank, yeah, thank hey, you, Micah, for coming. Yeah, just thank you, Micah, for coming out, bringing this to our attention. You know, I, I agree with Ryan. Um, you know, I might be a little biased being in the <laughs> industry, but travel all around the state, and uh, I can see the positive impact that a lot of breweries do have on their communities. And like Ryan said, you know, it creates a destination, you know, for town, uh, and it's a unique business, uh, something different than we currently have. So, you know, thanks for coming out, Micah. And, Look forward to 
working on these things and trying to make something happen. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. I'm 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 beyond happy that when I had a an absolute gut punch uh, from the Department of Transportation, that uh, when I looked back, well, like where else could I go? That um, the one of my favorite properties in town was for sale. So uh, it took about two minutes to negotiate, and uh, I've already talked to the HTC, uh, and I am officially on their agenda for the ninth. So hopefully, I can get a letter of appropriateness at that time. I'm sorry things didn't work out in our in our neighboring town, but uh, yeah. you know we're happy. We're happy. Uh, you know, you you are a resident of the town, and we're happy uh, you can consider consider All right. coming back to Weather Show. Yeah, man. Cheers. And the DOT just does that. You can't hold it against them. I don't. I really hey, don't. Hey, it's hey. It, it was. It's such an expected. <laughs> it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Take that, Yolanda. I heard that. <laughs> well, Yolanda, if you don't please don't torpedo me in Rocky Hill. I still plan on doing that in a couple of years. All right. All right. No, I will not. <laughs> Thanks. No, I, I like beer. I will not. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, and anybody else from the public? All right. Correspondence, a letter from the Federation of Planning Zoning Agencies, sadly canceling our annual AquaTurf conference. Um, aside from that, I guess the question is, is anybody up for a lifetime achievement award or anything like that? And uh, for anyone who hasn't already signed up, there might still be an opportunity to sign up for the land use conference this Saturday because uh, since it's by Zoom, there are physical space limitations the way there usually were. Um, usually the, the capacity is something like, you know, 270 with an overflow room for 50. And this year, the, the Zoom platform has the capacity for a thousand and last I heard, there were like 650 people signed up. So, wow. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's you're going to need a big screen for that. Yeah, they're going to have the like the little, the tiniest boxes and <laughs> some great, great. Well, actually, I think it's going to be a webinar format, so that only the only uh, limited number of speakers boxes are going to be visible in the. Other participants will be off on the right hand side in the list. So Does anyone else have anything they want to talk about tonight? We did reserve a few spots um, at the at the um, at the training. So uh, I think a couple of you had expressed an interest in doing that. So there are slots available. If if you did not receive an email or the book in the mail, um, let us know and we'll figure out the details there. Peter, can you listen to part of it, like uh, say Rich's uh, presentation or something, rather than the whole thing? That's completely up to you, George. I don't think they're going to be checking attendance. So. Um... Oh, okay. What's well, what's the town no, got? What's the town got to pay for it? I can't remember. Is Denise still on the call? She had made the arrangements. I think it's. Um, oh. I think it was forty dollars, fifty or something like that. Forty, fifty, somewhere in there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I don't like to spend 40 or 50 and not use the whole thing. And never mind. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. All right. Does anyone else have anything they want to talk about tonight? I'm just confirming, Peter, that you will give us off, what is it, the day before St. Patrick's Day? Yes, um, we do not have any business to conduct. So uh, you are you are officially given the night the night off. Yeah. <laughs> the pregame. Yes. <laughs> All right. Motion to close. Yep. All right. Motion, motion by Ryan. Motion to adjourn. Sorry. Yeah. Second. Motion by Ryan. Is there a second? Yep. Second, George. Okay. Second by Jim. All in favor, say aye. 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 Can I make a motion to have Ryan Allard be the uh, brew pub czar since we're <laughs> making czars tonight? Listen, I, any chance to be a czar, I'll take. <laughs> and if it's and if it's beer <laughs> and if it's beer related, I'll do it. You can have you can have sidewalks, George. You can have sidewalks. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, <laughs> are you making him a czar of what? No, you're the, you're the sidewalk 